Hey everyone, Noah Zerbe here. This is one of a series of short videos introducing key concepts in international political economy. In this video, we're going to look at the two key theoretical approaches to understanding IPE, liberalism and mercantilism. So let's get started. When we're talking about international political economy, we're broadly talking about how the contemporary political and economic systems function. Remember that the current global economic system of political economy is rooted in capitalist economic systems that emerged in Europe, particularly in England and the Netherlands, sometime around the 16th century. But it would not take the form familiar to us until sometime during the 18th or even the 19th century. Since then, it's differentiated into a number of distinct forms. Think of the differences between the more heavily free market-based systems common to the English-speaking world as opposed to the more socially democratic state interventionist systems commonly found in much of Europe to the system of state capitalism of contemporary China. But all capitalist systems share some common features. First, they center on private property, whether property is tangible like land or houses or intangible like stocks and bonds. Second, they're all rooted in concepts of self-interest through which people pursue their own good without or at least with limited concern for the collective good. But remember that capitalism holds that the individual pursuit of self-interest ultimately leads to the collective good. Indeed, this idea was central to Adam Smith's concept of the invisible hand. Writing in The Wealth of Nations in 1776, Smith famously comments that it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their self-regard or their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Third, Market-based competition governs relations between buyers and sellers and determines prices, not just for goods and services, but for wages as well. Fourth, individual agents, that is buyers and sellers, have freedom of choice with respect to the consumption, production, and investment. This is sometimes referred to as the idea of consumer sovereignty. And finally, the role of the government is generally limited. In the most extreme form, it's limited to the protection of private property and the enforcement of contracts. In more moderate forms, the government may also provide a social safety net of varying scope or scale, but it's the market that's the ultimate arbiter of success and failure. There are two broad schools of thought as to the origins of capitalism. While they agree on the broad historical contours, i.e. that capitalism emerged broadly between the 16th and 18th centuries in England and the Netherlands and gradually spread across Europe and around the world, they differ as to the dynamics of that process. The first group is rooted in classical economic liberalism and is most commonly attributed to the work of Adam Smith. Liberals tend to view capitalism as an expression of human nature. That is, as individuals, we're naturally self-interested. Liberals point to the fact that people have traded since time immemorial to support their argument. From the liberal perspective, capitalism was rooted in this historical process of barter and exchange, and that the gradual expansion of this process was facilitated by reducing the role of the state, freeing individuals to buy and sell as they wished. Essentially, from the liberal perspective, capitalism was always in us, just waiting to be let out. The second group is rooted in the Marxist critiques of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Unlike liberals who see capitalism as a simple expression of human nature, Marxists tend to view capitalism as a historically specific system that emerged because of economic and property relationships and the specific exercise of power in Great Britain and the Netherlands. Its global spread was rooted not in human nature, but in the power of Europe during the colonial period. Now, regardless of which theoretical explanation as to the origins of capitalism we adhere to, it's undeniable that the global political economy has undergone some radical transformations over time, so let's look briefly at that development now. The foundations of the global political economy are historically rooted in the dramatic expansion of international trade and colonization that emerged in the 16th century. Early on, beginning about the 1500s, when the technology permitted large-scale international trade and the social context of the state began to emerge, thinking about international trade was dominated by the philosophical approach or the theoretical school of mercantilism. Put simply, mercantilists view international trade as a function of or a key contributor to national prestige and power. 
Trade surpluses were viewed as the key avenue through which states would acquire wealth, and that wealth could be used to expand armies and pay for further conquest. Mercantilism thus viewed international trade as closely tied to national security. It argues that wealth, material wealth, especially the possession of large reserves of gold and silver, was a key indicator of national strength. Trade was an avenue, perhaps the key avenue, to secure specie, gold and silver, and acquire wealth to empower the state. The goal was to export more than you imported, running a balance of trade surplus, and securing gold reserves for the state. This theory was at the heart of early periods of colonialism, especially the colonialism practiced by the Spanish and Portuguese and their search for gold and silver in the Americas. But it also helps to explain Dutch colonialism and control over the spice trade and other efforts to secure monopolies over raw material imports and markets in the colonial world. Colonial ports were restricted from doing business with traders from other nations, and only the home country was permitted to import and sell goods there. In the broadest terms, mercantilist approaches view the international political economy as fundamentally a zero-sum game, meaning that one country's win was necessarily offset by another country's loss. There were no win-win scenarios, no rising tide that raises all ships. The policy prescriptions that flowed from this theoretical approach were pretty straightforward. Running a positive balance of trade, that is, exporting more than you imported, would force other countries to pay for that deficit by shipping you gold and silver. This surplus would be transformed into greater power for the state, particularly military power. Mercantilism dominated thinking about international political economy for more than 250 years, but the growing power of the British Empire and the Industrial Revolution that was taking place in that country would spark a fundamental transformation. Indeed, beginning in the middle of the 1700s, a new school of economic thought began to emerge, one that placed a greater emphasis on free trade and open markets. Dubbed liberalism, this work was advanced by thinkers like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. The central propositions of liberalism were that free trade benefits all parties involved, that specialization in trade could benefit everyone. This was the result of an idea called comparative advantage, a concept we explore in another video. But put simply, it's the idea that all countries benefit from free trade and open markets. It was the idea that international political economy was best viewed as a positive-sum game in which everyone could benefit, the rising tide that raised all boats. By specializing in trading, countries could consume more goods and more diverse goods than they could if they were cut off from international trade and attempted to be self-sufficient. Now, to be clear, colonialism was still the order of the day. But the Spanish and Portuguese model of colonialism, as driven by the search for gold and silver, increasingly gave way to a new model of colonization led by the British and the French. While gold and silver were certainly still welcome, colonies instead became viewed primarily as sources for raw materials to feed the ceaseless demand for factories in the home country. We also see colonies rooted in the permanent political expansion of the home country, with permanent settlements established in places like Australia, Canada, South Africa, and the United States. The policy prescriptions that flowed from liberalism differed dramatically from those of mercantilism. Rather than limiting foreign trade and attempting to control the economy, according to liberalism, governments should reduce their role in the economy and establish the conditions for competition and free markets. Free markets, not state intervention, was viewed as the path to prosperity. The idea took hold especially in Britain, the major power of the day. Britain used its dominant position in the global system to push for free trade, reducing its own trade barriers like the Corn Laws, and instead relying on its dominance over the market and its market position to expand its power and wealth. During the 18th and 19th centuries, economic liberalism was the predominant approach to global political economy. Indeed, the illiberal international system worked fairly well until the 1920s, when the Great Depression threw the international political economy into crisis. Beginning in 1929, the U.S. economy, and later the rest of the world's economies, entered into a period of crisis. The stock market crashed, unemployment spiked, and the U.S. economy spiraled downward. In response, the United States, following other leading economies around the world, established a series of policies intended to bring the U.S. out of crisis. It imposed new tariffs and trade barriers under the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930, and it devalued the dollar in an effort to promote American exports and protect the U.S. market from foreign competition. 
The thinking essentially went something like this. By imposing tariffs and trade barriers, the United States could make imports more expensive relative to domestically produced goods. As a result, American consumers would purchase more U.S.-made goods and fewer foreign-produced goods. This would generate more employment in the United States as factory hired more workers to expand production. At the same time, by devaluing the U.S. dollar, it would make American exports cheaper relative to foreign produced goods. This would increase the sale of American goods abroad, thus generating more production and increasing employment in the United States. In some sense, it represented an attempted return to mercantilist policies of nearly two centuries earlier. Collectively, these policies came to be referred to as beggar thy neighbor policies. Essentially, they were attempting to protect the U.S. economy by exporting the American economic decline to the rest of the world. But other countries around the world were suffering similar economic problems and were pursuing similar economic policies. As a result, the policies were totally ineffective and merely served to exacerbate the crisis. The U.S. and the rest of the world continued to sink further into economic depression. And as an aside, this is another good example of the prisoner's dilemma we talk about elsewhere in the course. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the anyone anyone the great depression passed the anyone anyone a tariff bill the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act which anyone raised or lowered raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government did it work anyone anyone know the effects it did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. So, just how bad was the Great Depression? Before we get into the numbers, let's think a bit about what life was like in the 1920s. There was no social safety net. If you lost your job, there were no food stamps, no unemployment insurance, there was no Medicare or Medicaid, no social security. Private soup kitchens were established by local charities and often organized crime families to feed the poor and unemployed, but there was no guarantee and there was no governmental program to protect people who lost their jobs. So just how bad was the Great Depression then? We can look at some macro numbers to get a broad sense. Between 1929, when Wall Street crash occurred, and 1932, when the Great Depression reached its peak, all of the world's major economies were in crises. Industrial production had declined by between one quarter in the United Kingdom and France, by up to 50% in the United States and Germany. Wholesale prices, the price paid for retailers to purchase goods for commercial sales, declined by about one-third, signaling a sharp decline in consumer demand due to lack of wages. Foreign trade had collapsed, declining by between half in France and three-quarters in the United States, as countries imposed new trade barriers and restricted imports. And unemployment skyrocketed. In the United Kingdom, it more than doubled. In France and Germany, it more than tripled. And in the United States, unemployment increased by more than 600%. The Great Depression was ultimately brought to a close by the massive increase in government spending and employment sparked by World War II. To prevent the outbreak of another global economic crisis, the United States, as the world's leading economic and military power after World War II, led the development of a new international economic system, often referred to as embedded liberalism. Those ideas are covered in detail in another video. So that's it for now. I hope you found this video useful. Please be sure to check out the other videos in this series, and thanks for watching. Bye.